Hello, we are continuing to talk about civil rights and specifically today we are going to talk about Brown versus the Board of Education. We are in the Prentice Hall United States History Modern America textbook. It is available at the National Emergency Archives and we will commence with reading through this part of the chapter. Brown versus the Board of Education. Although the civil rights movement had made some gains in the 1940s, it stalled in the early 1950s. Feeling that the executive and legislative branches of government were unwilling to promote additional reforms, the NAACP decided to turn to the federal courts to attain its goals. The NAACP challenges segregation. By the end of World War II, the NAACP had become the largest and most powerful civil rights organization in the nation. It attracted a wide array of individuals, both black and white, including a number of lawyers. In the 1940s, a team of NAACP attorneys pursued a strategy to challenge in the courts the legality of segregation. Thurgood Marshall, an African-American lawyer from Baltimore, Maryland, headed the legal team that mounted the challenge. In 1950, the NAACP won a number of key cases. In Sweat v. Painter, the Supreme Court ruled that the state of Texas had violated the 14th Amendment by establishing a separate but unequal all-black law school. Similarly, in the McLaurin v. Oklahoma State Regents, the court ruled that the state of Oklahoma had violated George McLaren's constitutional rights. Even though McLaren had been admitted to the Graduate School of the University of Oklahoma, he was denied equal access to the library, dining hall, and classrooms. According to the Supreme Court, a truly equal education involved more than simply admitting African Americans to previously all-white universities. The court strikes down segregated schools. Not long after it won these cases, the NAACP mounted a much broader challenge to segregated public education at all grade levels. This challenge became known as Brown v. the Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas. In the Sweat v. McLaren cases, and the McLaren cases, the NAACP had asserted that Texas and Oklahoma had failed to provide equal educational experiences. In the Brown case, however, the NAACP challenged the separate but equal principle itself which had been established in the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case. The Supreme Court agreed with the NAACP's argument that segregated public education violated the U.S. Constitution. All nine of the court's justices supported the Brown decision, which was written by newly appointed Chief Justice Earl Warren. Does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race deprive the children of the minority group equal education opportunities? Warren asked in his decision, we believe that it does. The Chief Justice and the court declared in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. In the same month as the Brown decision, the Supreme Court decided another civil rights case, this time involving Mexican Americans. In Hernandez versus Texas, the court ended the exclusion of Mexican Americans from trial juries. The Hernandez decision was the first Supreme Court ruling against discrimination targeting a group other than African Americans. Reaction to Brown The Brown decision was one of the most significant and controversial in American history. Because public education touched so many African or so many Americans, it had a great impact, a greater impact than cases involving only professional and graduate schools. Moreover, by overturning the principle of separate but equal, the court lent its support to the views of many civil rights advocates that all forms of segregation were wrong. In a separate ruling known as Brown II, the court called for the implementation of its decision with all deliberate speed across the nation. However, most Southerners had no intention of desegregating their schools without a fight. In 1956, about 100 Southern members of Congress endorsed the Southern Manifesto. They pledged to oppose the Brown ruling through all lawful means, on the grounds that the court had misinterpreted the Constitution. More ominously, the Ku Klux Klan staged a revival. Many prominent white Southerners and businessmen organized white citizens' councils that declared that the South would not be integrated. The citizens' councils imposed economic and political pressure against those who favored compliance with the Supreme Court's decisions. So, checkpoint. Why was the Brown versus Board of Education decision important? It's important because it desegregates not just the schools, it starts with the schools, but it's going to be used to desegregate all public life. 
So federal and state governments clash. Historically, education has been a state matter. States and local school boards run the schools, and the federal government had little involvement. Local and state officials resisted the Brown decision's order to desegregate, and clashes with the federal government resulted. The most famous battle took place in 1957 in Little Rock, Arkansas. A conflict erupts in Little Rock. The Little Rock School Board had an established plan to gradually desegregate its schools, beginning with Central High School. Nine young African-American students volunteered to enroll. But Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus announced his opposition to integration and called out, Arcan called out the Arkansas State National Guard. When the nine students arrived at Central High, the soldiers blocked their way. One of the nine, Elizabeth Eckford, has described the scene. An angry white mob began to approach her with some screaming, Lynch her! Lynch her! Eckford sought out a friendly face, someone who might help. I looked into the face of an old woman, and it seemed a kind face, she recalled. But when I looked at her again, she spat on me. Fortunately, another white woman whisked Eckford away on a public bus before the mob could have its way. None of the nine African-American students gained entrance to the school that day. Up until the Little Rock crisis, President Eisenhower had provided little leadership on the civil rights front. Following the Brown decision, he did not urge the nation to rapidly desegregate its schools, Privately, he expressed his misgivings about the ruling. But when Governor Faubus resisted the will of the federal courts, Eisenhower realized he had to act. He sent federal troops to Little Rock to protect the students and enforce the court's decision. Eisenhower explained this action in a nationally televised address. It is important that the reasons for my action be understood by all of our citizens. A foundation of our American way of life is our national respect for the law. If resistance to the federal court orders ceases at once, the further presence of federal troops will be unnecessary, and the city of Little Rock will return to its normal habits of peace and order, and a blot upon the fair name and high honor of our nation on the world will be removed. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Address on Little Rock, 1957. For the entire school year, federal troops stayed in Little Rock, escorting nine students to and from Central High and guarding them on the school grounds. On the last day of class, Ernest Green, the one senior of the nine, became the first African American to graduate from Central High School. The showdown demonstrated the president would not tolerate open defiance of the law. Still, most southern states found ways to resist full compliance with the court's decision. Many years would pass before black and white children went to school together. Congress passes a civil rights law. Civil rights forces enjoyed a small victory when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957, and President Eisenhower signed it into law. This established the United States Civil Rights Commission, which had the power to investigate violations of civil rights. The law also gave the U.S. Attorney General greater power to protect the voting rights of African Americans. But overall, the law lacked teeth. Its main significance was that it was the first civil rights bill passed by Congress since Reconstruction. Checkpoint. Why did President Eisenhower send federal troops to Little Rock? He sent troops to Little Rock because the governor was blatantly disregarding the law that the federal government had decided upon in the Supreme Courts. And he decided that he could not have individual states choosing to ignore federal laws. So he sent the troops in to make sure that the law was being followed. And that wraps up this section of our textbook. And we will finish up talking about at least the beginnings of civil rights in the next video. Until then, stay safe.